Welcome to the last class, class number 10 of CSC 104. We are going to try desperately to finish up in the time allotted, and we only have about 4,000 topics to discuss, so let's get started. We're going to talk about the Bible codes. Does the Bible contain such a thing as Bible codes? Okay. Uh, Hank Hanegraaff has blasted me several times on his program, <laughs> four times now, and probably will be more, and never has called me once to give me a chance to defend myself, because he says, Hovind teaches the Bible codes. Well, I do teach, I think, I do teach that it's a subject worthy of study. I think you should look into it. Chuck Missler has a great book on the Bible codes. Uh, Chuck Missler in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, I was just there two days ago, um, has really excellent work on that topic, if you want to read it. Of course, he gets blasted by Hank also. Uh, the movie, <coughs> uh, The Omega Codes, uh, is a sequel to, what's the other one about the, the, the movie that was done about the rapture, Second Coming, or something like that, Mark of the Beast, 666, whatever. What is it? Left Behind. Behind. That's it, the Left Behind series. This is really a good book, about, again, about the Bible codes. That, and so G Grant Jeffrey has a chapter in this book about the Bible codes, which is really good. Uh, <coughs> the book is about a lot of things. Uh, just one chapter is about the Bible codes. So that, if you want more on that, that's the type of thing I would recommend. Let me tell you briefly what it is. It was discovered by apparently a couple of heathen that uh, the Bible in Hebrew contains a code that simply could not possibly be accidental. Here's an example of Hebrew on the screen. Uh, in, the, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, for instance, they put every letter of Deuteronomy, of every letter of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch it's called, they put all of them into a computer in Hebrew with no spaces, no, par no punctuation, just a string of letters. They just randomly began looking for names, like Hitler, for instance, in Hebrew, is whatever that is up there in Hebrew, okay? So they found the first letter, mark over until you find the second letter of his name. And let's say it is, in this case, it's 13 spaces. So I tell the computer, find every 13th letter. And it goes along and found Hitler. Then in that same passage, they began looking for other things that have to do with Hitler. For instance, there's the Hebrew words for uh, uh, a people cry murder, slaughter. Uh, King of the Nazis was found in the same passage. Uh, Auschwitz was found every 22 letters, or every 13 letters gave in the bitter sea of Auschwitz, uh, how, how, however many letters it is for Hitler. The fact is, there seem to be some very interesting hidden codes in the Bible. How you could possibly write a book that would do that is beyond my comprehension. I think it was a Hebrew, two Hebrew scholars and two mathematicians or something that, that discovered this and said, you know, all the computers in the world couldn't possibly write a book where the text means something as you read it, but also there's a hidden code. Now, I couldn't prove it's true or not, and I don't I hope I've never preached that I know for a fact this is true. I, I don't know for a fact it's true. But there have been some people a lot smarter than me and a lot smarter than Hank Hanegraaff who have said, yep, it's true. This, uh, there is something to this. And if you want more on that, I'd recommend this book by Grant Jeffries or this book by Chuck Missler, and it'll just really an amazing study. I think it's worth studying. What about UFOs? Again, I get blasted for this one. I don't know what the truth is about UFOs. They are unidentified flying objects. <laughs> They're not identified yet. If they were, they would be IFOs, identified flying objects. <laughs> um, down in Ica, Peru, where the Ica stones are found, some many strange things are found, including an Ica stone with a chief or something, an Indian of some kind, looking through a telescope, apparently, at something flying through the air. Maybe a comet, maybe a UFO, I don't know. Probably a comet with the tail on it. But there have been stories of strange things being seen in space, UFOs, for a long time. Many of them, I think, have natural explanations. Weather, the weather uh, balloons, for instance, that are released periodically, they have a big, huge silver balloon, you know, four foot, six foot, eight foot in diameter. They fill it full of helium, tie a string on it, and attach a bunch of weather instruments. The weather instruments are reporting back, you know, what's the temperature, what's the air pressure, et cetera, from various elevations as it goes up, or altitudes as it goes up. And some people will see a weather balloon floating along. Oh, I saw a UFO, you know, and they call in. Yeah, right, we just released a weather balloon, folks. There's nothing to worry about, okay? Sometimes there's a phenomenon called swamp gas where vegetation is rotting at the bottom of the swamp, and it, all of a sudden, the swamp burps. And the swamp gas can actually go up as sort of a bubble through the atmosphere and distort, uh, make it like a lens in the air. 
you've probably all seen on hot days where you're, you see the hot air coming off the blacktop and it looks like you know, things are dancing or moving around. There may be natural explanations for all of the UFO sightings. I don't know. However, I think there are some that are just too hard to explain. The books I would recommend on that topic are uh, one by David Allen Lewis. This is a, uh, a Christian author called UFO 666, uh, Cults and Contacts, Antichrist Delusion. And this is a small version of his much larger book, uh, same authors, about UFOs. Basically, I could summarize it by saying their um, synopsis is that there are two kinds of UFOs. There are top-secret government craft, and there are satanically owned and operated vehicles. Satan apparently knows from reading his Bible that there's going to be a rapture, a catching away of God's children sometime. Pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. <laughs> okay, we won't get into all that right now. But there will be a catching away. First Thessalonians chapter 4 teaches that. Satan is going to have to have some kind of excuse to tell the rest of the people that are left behind what happened to all the Christians. And so if I were the devil, I would start a few hundred years early with UFO-type sightings just to have an explanation for what happened to everybody. Where are they? Another good book you may want to get is Alien Encounters, again by Chuck Missler. It's a great book, uh, difficult to read. Uh, the guy's really smart, but <laughs> good luck. Uh, read Chuck Missler's book on Alien Encounters. His uh, phone number, 800-K-House, Koinonia House, 1 is their phone number. Or their website is, I think, www.khouse.com or .org. Remind me, Jessica, let's put that on the screen, okay? What's the website for Koinonia House? Another one, again, very difficult to read, is the book by uh, Stan Deo called The Cosmic Conspiracy. Uh, we don't sell that. Here's a couple phone numbers where you can get it, if should you be interested. He also says there are two kinds of UFOs. There are top-secret government craft using a phenomena called electrogravitic propulsion. And he goes through the book and explains how electrogravitics works. It's very different than jet propulsion. According to Stan Dale, of course, if you get in a jet and it takes off, you feel a G-force on your body. The jet has a motor on it. You don't have a motor on you. So you get slammed back into the seat. When it stops, you go thrown, you're thrown forward because, uh, you know, that's the force of gravity. When the plane turns sideways, you experience a G-force to the side. With electrogravitics, he says, everything, every molecule is drawn electrically by a static charge. So there's absolutely no G-force, which explains why so many people, a guy last week at the church I was at said, Brother Hovind, I saw a UFO. I said, tell me about it. He said, you won't laugh? I said, no, I'm interested. I talked to other folks. I want to hear your story. This is the first Christian I've had tell me he saw one. I don't know if that means anything or not, but this, uh, it's my experience. He said, this thing was probably about six feet in diameter. It wasn't huge. And it was going along. Uh, all of a sudden, it took off real fast and then turned an instant right angle. He said, that's just simply physically impossible. It wasn't just a curve. It, bang, turned a right angle. Many, many people have described UFOs as doing that type of thing. Well, if it's electrogravitic propulsion, in theory, that is certainly possible, and there would be absolutely no G-force. The person inside wouldn't even realize he's moving. They feel none of those forces, apparently. Read Stan Dale's book if you want more on that. I don't have an answer for UFOs. I wish I did. Okay. How long were Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned? All I can do is give you a couple of clues from Scripture. Genesis chapter 5 says, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son, and his name was Seth. Before this time, they had Cain and Abel. No dates are given. Before that, they were kicked out of the garden. So probably the maximum time they could have been in the garden is around 120 years, maybe. Okay, I don't know. How, how, old, was, how old were Cain and Abel when they got in the fight? The uh, Bible doesn't say. Were they 10-year-olds or were they 50-year-olds? Did, did Adam and Eve already have 20 more kids by then? The Bible doesn't say. All that is just guesswork on anybody's part. Okay? The other clue we have is that on day 6, at the end of day 6, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God looked at everything and said, it's very good. So we know everything was fine at the end of day 6. So Lucifer had not fallen yet. Adam and Eve were still in the garden. Obviously, that's where God made them. Okay? So at least for the first day, everything's fine. How long it was till they messed up, I don't have a clue. I personally suspect 
probably 100 to 120 years. Everything was fine. Lucifer got jealous of their fellowship with God. Lucifer said, you know, they ought to be worshiping me. He rebelled against God, came down to earth, tricked Eve. She gave it to Adam. Adam said, oh, man, you blew it, honey. If I don't eat this, you're going to be in trouble. So Adam willfully became sin to save his wife, like 1 Timothy chapter 2 tells us. So really, that's all the clues we have. We know God drove him out of the garden and put the cherubims there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Um, this was before any children were born, as far as we can figure out. So that would have been sometime 100, 120 years maximum. And Eve is the mother of all living. Okay, where is the Garden of Eden? I get asked this question surprisingly, you know, boy, you know, it's a shame Saddam is in charge of Iraq because that's where the Garden of Eden was. I say, where do you get that? Well, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first was Pison, Gihon, Hittichel, whatever. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And they'll say, see, Euphrates runs through Baghdad. Well, no, slow down just a minute. Okay. First place, a river coming up in one place and becoming four rivers is very different than what we have today. Today we have many rivers running together to make one river. This is one river making four separate rivers. This is backwards. So apparently this was a giant spring coming out, which became four rivers. And the fact that one of them is named Euphrates has nothing to do with Baghdad. When people got off the ark... They probably looked around and saw things that reminded them of something before the flood and said, you know, that looks like Euphrates. Okay, let's call it Euphrates. Just like people came from York and named it New York when they got here. It <laughs> doesn't mean it's the same place. I mean, that flood wiped everything out. So there's absolutely, I don't think, any possible way to tell where the Garden of Eden was. It could be right here under 500 feet of mud. I mean, everything was totally destroyed by that flood. So I think... You know, if Noah was in the ark for, say, six to eight months, well, seven months when he finally hit bottom, how far could you float in seven months? Around the world? Yeah, anywhere. That's no telling at all where the Garden of Eden was, as far as I can figure out. I think we know where it landed. Didn't they have drogue stones, though, or like anchors? We don't know if the drogue stones would keep them in one place or just simply act as shock absorbers to make them not... They still could be drifting around, but just not shaking around while they're drifting. So I don't think we have a clue of, of where it was. Now, there was a river today called Euphrates. There was one in the Garden of Eden called Euphrates. That doesn't mean there's any similarity between the two. It's just the same name. That's all it is. There's River Euphrates right there in Iraq. Okay, what about the mark of the beast? What is it? Will we have to get it? I do not know uh, exactly what it is. I'll give you the current theories. Probably 200 years ago, they had their theories that the mark of the beast was, you know, colored ink on paper or something, you know, every age tries to put, you know, what's happening then into, you know, interpret that into scripture. Now, who was the, who was the Antichrist? Boy, a lot of people thought it was Napoleon. Some people said, oh no, it was Adolf Hitler. Some people think it's Bill Clinton. Well, now you're getting close maybe, but uh, I don't know. I don't know that. Revelation chapter 13 says he calls it all, this is Satan doing this in chapter 13, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. It says a mark in, not on. It's a mark in the right hand or in their forehead. I, I take, I'm one of those guys who, Bible believer, every word is there for a reason and it's important. And God didn't make any mistakes. In 1972, the barcode was developed what they decided was that a computer can only recount to one. Zero, one, and then you've got to start over again. Zero, one, zero, one. That's all the farther a computer can count. It only counts in zeros and ones. It's like an on switch or an off switch. So to make a letter A of the alphabet, they decided, okay, let's, let's encode everything on the keyboard with zeros and ones. Binary code. So they said, okay, the letter A is going to be one, one, or whatever it is. I don't know. I'm making this up. Okay. One, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one. And they gave it eight bits of information. Is it eight bits make a byte or eight bytes make a bit? Whichever it is. Eight bits make a byte. I think that's right, but I don't know. Each one is called a bit of information. Eight of them together is called a byte. So your computer stores megabytes, right? Megabyte is a million bytes of information, which would be eight million bits of information. A bit is simply a zero or a one. That's all computers read. 
So every number and every letter and every keystroke on your computer was given a binary code. Then they learned, out, they learned that a laser shining across this, if it's a black line or a white line, can read it. So the laser shines across the barcode when you scan stuff at the store, beep, reads all those black lines and white lines, translates it into numbers, which translates it into the computer into a price. Oh, you just bought toothpaste, you know, $1.29. Beep, thank you. I mean, it does it like lightning, of course, you know, today. But this was all, 1972, this was developed. It, it may be pure coincidence, and I sure don't know if this is true or not, but this is just a reasonable theory. Um, the number six, I want you to notice there are three different ways it can be made. And they did this for a long, complicated reason. Some of the numbers have only two possible ways to make it. Others have three possible ways to make it. The fat black line is simply several black lines together. It may be three black lines. A black line represents a number one. A white line represents a number zero to the computer. So when the laser reads black, it counts it as a one. If it gets four of them together, it counts one, 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 one. If it gets a wide white line, it'll just count it as, you know, zero, 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 until it runs into something black, and then it counts it as a, as a one. It may be pure coincidence, but it is interesting. They chose as the barcode the first two sets of lines is the exact same configuration as the number six. Now, I know full well these are just guard bars, okay? In the center, there are two guard bars, and at the end, there are two guard bars. But it is an interesting coincidence that it's two skinny lines with a single white space between, which is the binary code for six. Here are the binary codes in computer language. Uh, for instance, a zero on the upper left-hand side there can be written as a... Uh, let me get my glasses on here. That's awful to get old. Zero can be written as 0001101. That is eight bits of information. Or it can be written as 1110010, okay, which is, I think, the exact opposite. It's not the exact opposite? No, it's not. Okay, the last two are different. There's probably a long, complicated reason for why they have two or even three different ways to make some of the numbers. And this goes into what the computers need to, to read and understand. The number six, uh, top of the right hand side, can be written as a 01011111 or 1010000. Anyway, it ends up with two black lines with a single white line in between. And that is what they chose to be the guard bar. Every, bar, every uh, barcode you get, unless it's a personal barcode for like a library. A library might have their own barcode to use, and they don't, they don't use the, in, the international barcode. Okay? But the uh, universal UPC, universal purchasing code, or what is it? Universal product code. Yeah. Universal product code, UPC symbol, is, has two skinny lines at the front, two skinny lines in the middle, which tells the computer to switch and read the other, the other way to write it. Okay? There's two ways to write a 6. If you happen to see a 6 in a UPC code, on one side it'll be written with one way, the other side it'll be written the other way. Apparently what this does, the computer scans this, and the first half of the code tells the computer something about this product, what country it's made in, what factory, what state, or whatever. Okay, Each factory might be given a code. Okay, your factory number, you know, XYZ, whatever. On the right side, it's for the individual product. So when it scans this thing, it will say, beep, book made in, you know, wherever it's made, what country, what city, and this is the name of the book. And then the store owner at that time has the opportunity to program in the last five numbers only. How much do you want it to cost? You know, he cannot change where it's made. The first half of the code is he, he cannot alter. But he can tell his computer, when you read uh, this number, give it this price tag or something. Okay. Years ago, some of the barcodes came out and they had an F and an H underneath, sideways. Maybe pure coincidence, but some people said, wow, this could be standing for forehead or hand. And the UPC code may indeed be the mark of the beast. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's still certainly a reasonable possi possibility. But microchips now are available, which use the same technology, much more advanced in 30 years, to... Uh, encode a number. I have in my wallet, if I can find it here, here we go, one of the microchips, about the size of a grain of rice. Can Andrew, does that show up if you zoom in on that? Little bitty microchip, I'll put it against my shirt here. 
little microchip about the size of a grain of rice. They're about four to five bucks a piece. Uh, we're going to order a bunch of them and then print up a little color card and punch the card out and laminate them in the card and offer them maybe for ten bucks or something by the time we get done doing all that work to it. So, so people can carry one in their wallet just to show uh, what, what may indeed be the mark of the beast or the forerunner to it. These little chips, there's a special needle that uh, is called a 12-gauge needle that will inject this under your skin. Very simple procedure. Here's a dog uh, being injected with a needle. It's interesting. This is a Sunday school quarterly telling people, wow, isn't this great? You should go get your pet injected with a chip. If he's ever lost, he can be found. Well, yeah, that may be great to find your pet. I'm not against finding people's pets. But I think it's, it's conditioning the mind to accept this technology. You might want to get a hold of Carl Sanders, who has lots of information, Trumpet Ministries. Uh, Carl claims he is one of the guys who helped develop the chip. He was involved in the development of this chip. And he goes around and speaks on that. His uh, uh, website, not website, his email, Shofar, which I forget what it stands for, some Hebrew phrase, sho-phar at trumpetmen.org. Uh, Dean Martin here in Pensacola, uh, here's his phone number, Pensacola 850-455-5011. He is really keeping up on this smart card technology and has a mountain of information on it. Were any of you here when he came to our staff meeting and uh, I, he, I asked him to come to a demonstration for our staff here at CSE. He set up his laptop computer, plugged a little thing in it that was about oh, half the size of this book. He said, now Brother Hovind, this is a barcode, this is a, a chip reader. Watch this. He took a microchip, stuck it under his arm, and walked, past, walked across the room, past the computer. When he got within about four feet, I think it was, all of a sudden, beep, up on the screen came his name, address, social security number, birth date, phone number, everything. I said, is all that in the chip? He said, no, no. All that's in the chip is a code that is already in the database. Each person is assigned a code. Okay, you are, you know, 7VXTB49 or something. And that is your chip. And then that chip simply activates, it's, it's powered by radio waves from the sensor. It does not have a battery in it. It's, it's, it doesn't do anything. But if a certain radio signal hits it, it'll respond, it'll energize it and send back, their, this is my number. Beep, hello, you just found, you know, XYZ, ABC, whatever. So that is all programmed in the computer. And all of this is, a, is simply an identif identifying chip. Very fascinating that this kind of technology is, uh, is here, folks, right now. You can order the microchips. You can find someone, if they have a chip in them, there's a website, P-R-O-D-G-E, progenius.com, and they have a satellite system. You can get a chip put in your car, and if your car is ever stolen, you pay 10 or 20 bucks or whatever. They will activate the satellites to look for that number. And they use, you know, global positioning, beep, 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 tsh, your car is right here. That can be done now. Next, very simple, obvious next step is, hey, let's put the chip in everybody's head or in their hand. So I think we're going to see that coming soon. Here's a guy, scientist uh, in the UK, I believe, who put a chip put in his arm and had his whole house computerized. All he had to do was walk into the room and the lights would come on and say, good morning, Mr. Uh, whatever his name is here, uh, Kevin Warwick. Good morning, Professor Warwick. When he walks, he had a program, when he walks past a certain place, it turns on the coffee pot. By the time he's ready, by the time he gets there, it's ready for him. When he leaves the house, it automatically shuts off all the lights. Real cool. However, anybody who's keeping track of all this can figure out everything you've ever done for the last few hours or for the last few weeks or the last few years. No more privacy. That's going to be the danger. Uh, part of Carl Sanders' uh, presentation is this, where he goes through the Greek word, Greek words for Mark, for instance, um, and he gives the Greek character there. This is, is this from Strong's or Young's or Cruden's, one of the concordances. But it's the uh, number 5480, uh, chiragma, however you pronounce that, chiragma, from the same as 5482, a scratch or etching. Anybody know how they make computer chips? They etch into silicone, don't they? a stamp as a badge of servitude 
or a sculptured figure, a statue, a graven mark. Next one, uh, character from the same as 5482, a graver, the tool of the person, engraving, the figure stamped, an exact copy of, representation, the express image. Uh, as you read this, you start to think, these are the words used in the Revelation chapter 13 there, is the, uh, I think it's probably Strong's. The last one, uh, C-H-A-R-A-X, to sharpen, to a point, akin to uh, 1125, to the idea of scratching, a stake, palisade or rampart, military mount. Um, the chip is engraved silicone, etched silicone, and it is pierced in and put under the skin. Part of the microchip has a little, I think a Teflon or some kind of uh, coating on one end, so that as soon as it's put in your skin, your body begins to grow and attach to it and sticks it in place so it doesn't move around. Otherwise, it would migrate around your body with the blood flow. Okay. So all of the uh, Greek words, apparently, certainly if someone's looking for this, uh, could interpret to mean this is talking about a computer chip put in the body. Anyway, there's Kevin Warwick with his... Uh, plan to become one with his computer. <laughs> and I'm sure it'll solve all sorts of problems. It'll cause one big one, though. No privacy. No one sex offenders could be marked and watched. That might be a good thing. Like the sign, Welcome to Arkansas, home of Bill Clinton. In compliance with Megan's law, the above is a known sex offender. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. Um, technology and what's happening for the future is, is both exciting, you know, seeing what can be done. I mean, putting a calculator in a watch you can wear on your hand and store 300 phone numbers in a stopwatch. I mean, it's amazing what can be done. But it's also a little scary when you realize how easily this could be used by bad people to do bad things. Like HARP technology, if you want to study something fascinating, H-A-A-R-P, I think it's High Altitude Aurora something research project. I, I believe that's what it stands for. Uh, this is a good book uh, by a guy who's not even a Christian who says it's pretty scary what's happening, folks. They're using uh, high-altitude aurora, which is like the you know, northern lights and southern lights, aurora borealis. They've discovered if you microwave, if you beam a microwave up at the sky, it'll heat up a certain area, and it'll, hot air expands, so you can create a lens in the air several miles above the Earth. Well, you know what a lens does? A lens can be used to magnify. What if you uh, don't want somebody to get rain? You want to starve out a country. You program the computer to beam up the microwave to heat up the atmosphere to create a lens at certain times of the day so that it always produces heat over that area. Just like, you know, you put a lens under the sun, you know, to heat up something. Now you got a big one, you know, 20 miles across or 100 miles across or whatever. It heats up that area. Hot air expands. You can't have clouds almost always when there's uh, warm air mass or hot air, uh, high pressure, it drives away the clouds. Low pressure normally means rain is coming. You just figure out the weather patterns of a certain area and you just spend the next three years making sure they don't get any rain and pretty soon they're starving from no food growing. Or suppose you want it to flood. And then you do the opposite. You know, you study the weather patterns. Okay, where do I have to heat up the ground to cause, you know, rain, rain, weather patterns that will eventually, you know, flood these folks? I'm not sure what all has been done. I know that there have been, uh, there has been a lot of research on what's called a virtual lens and a virtual mirror being created in the atmosphere by the High Altitude Aurora Research Project. It's called HARP. And the book is Angels Don't Play This HARP. This is something they're going to use to control weather. Apparently it has been used. They also use ELF, which is uh, extremely low frequency antennas as part of this program. Um, and you can get a lot of this stuff from, a lot of stuff on the internet about this. Uh, look up ELF, 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 extremely low frequency uh, used to control weather. But here they put the antenna, uh, I believe they drill a hole and put the antenna in the ground. It's not even visible. Instead of an antenna sticking up in the air, it's down in a well. And does all sorts of strange things. 
Somebody wrote a very convincing article, I don't know if it's true, that uh, the space shuttle that blew up did have a leaky seal, but it was actually exploded, or the problem was exacerbated by a Soviet vessel offshore, which had been monitoring this uh, with and using ELF, extra low frequency, to set up a vibration that caused it to fail. Maybe far-fetched, maybe something we're studying. Jeff, you like that kind of stuff? Find out for me, okay? In, uh, this article came out in the paper, in the European newspaper, back in 92. You know, 10 years ago, they were able to use satellites to count the number of cows you had to make sure you weren't cheating on your income tax. You're claiming you got 80 cows and you really got 400. You know, you're making, raising the rest for profit. Satellites are going to count the cows in your field. Calculate how much acreage. You say you planted so many acres of corn? Well, let's just see. There's a picture of the human chip, about two centimeters long. This is an article back from January 99, talking about the human body. Is the human body a fit place for a microchip? The debate is no longer hypothetical. It can be done. Whether this is, now this is a phony picture that somebody put on the internet claiming, oh, the mark of the beast is, is here, you know. Somebody did that to see how far the Christians would carry it, but shows a microchip in the hand. Uh, Dr. Kirk, professor, lectured at 100 universities. Uh, his assessment of the coming New World Order was that it will reduce everyone to one common denominator. And this guy thinks it's good, by the way. Uh, professor Cook says, the system will be made up of a single currency, single centrally financed government, single tax system, single language, single political system, single world court of justice. Boy, just what the Bible predicted, a one world government. A single head, that's a one individual leader, a single state religion. He further stated, each person will have a registered number without which he will not be allowed to buy or sell. What did Revelation predict? If you don't have the mark, you can't buy or sell. And there will be a one universal world church. Anyone who refuses to take part in the system will have no right to exist. Pretty scary. There's people out there who believe this. Revelation 14 says, if you receive the mark and his image, and if you worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, then you shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. I think there's a significance to the word and there. Like apparently you have to do more than one thing, not just receive the mark. It could be that babies will be injected with a chip who have no, no opportunity to reject it. I mean, I don't know. Take it for yourself. Um, we covered a little bit about the straw man back on seminar part five, you know, about you know, who, who owns who. Are we in Kansas? Are we in Oz? So we're going to skip that part uh, for now corporate soul and all that, and Social Security and income tax. We won't have time to cover all that right now. Okay, what about the Shroud of Turin? I have a guy who emails me. I think, Jessica, you get email from the guy who's always about the uh, Swedish guy, Swarden. Our list of, everybody's computer here gets uh, jammed with email from some guy in Sweden who says, yep, the Shroud of Turin is legitimate. You know, this is proof that Jesus was here on Earth. Well, and I, somebody sent me this book, you know, about the Shroud of Turin. You know, wow, what a great thing. We have the actual robe Jesus was buried in. Somebody's making a lot of money off of this, for one thing, okay. Uh, the Catholic Church, I think, has uh, used this to turn an enormous profit. Well, would you like to come actually see the Shroud of Turin and touch it? It's only 50 bucks, you know, <laughs> whatever. Okay, is that the Shroud of Turin? Is this the cloth Jesus was buried in? Notice this picture on the right, you can see the face. They say it was burned in a fire back in 1400 or something. And they, somebody put the fire out, but it was scorched pretty badly, according to the story, okay? So five or 600 years ago, it was scorched. But they say it shows his arms crossed. You can see his hands, and you can see the scars on the hands where the nails held him to the cross, going right through his hand. Um, there are numerous problems with this, okay? If you nail somebody through the hand, it's just a matter of time, and it rips out between the fingers. They crucified people by nailing through the wrist, they got a block of wood with a hole in it like a giant washer and pounded the nail through the washer and through the wrist. It's more painful. All your nerves are right there, and it can't rip out. I mean, you're doing this to hurt the guy. You make it as painful as possible. So that's how they did it. And in the, in the uh, Bible language, when you wash the hands, that was understood to go up to the elbow. All of this is called the hand. Clear down to here. This is part of your hand, okay? Is this the cloth Jesus was buried in? They say in the shroud that you could still see the outline of his beard and the crown of thorns, 
and his long hair and um, the wounds in his side and the wounds in his feet. You see, yep, this is proof. This is the place where Jesus, this is the cloth. This is it, folks. Well, it might be an old rag and somebody might have been buried in it. I wouldn't argue any of that. But it's not the one Jesus was buried in. I can prove that. John chapter 11, Lazarus. Jesus said, Lazarus, you know, come forth. He that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face bound about with a napkin. That was the custom of burying people. You wrap them up like a mummy, but you put a different cloth over their face. Let's see how Jesus was buried. John chapter 20. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Could that shroud be the shroud Jesus was buried in? Absolutely not. It might be from the time of Christ. It might even be older. You can carbon date it. This guy sends me stuff. Oh, they carbon dated the shroud and it's 2,000 years old. Yeah. I, first, I don't know that that's true or not, but it wouldn't matter. It can't be the one Jesus was buried in. Plain and simple. Again, Luke chapter 24. The clothes laid by themselves. Okay? Isaiah chapter 50 prophesied that Jesus would have his hair, his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. He did not have a beard when they buried him. He might have had a beard in real life. That was the custom in those countries and still is. But that's not the shroud Jesus was buried in. Okay? Plus, 1 Corinthians tells us, it's, nature teaches us, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Why would Jesus do something? Jesus did not have long hair. Why would he do something against Scripture? Some people say, oh, Jesus had long hair because he was a Nazarite. No, he was not a Nazarite. He was a Nazarene. He was from Nazareth. But a Nazarite is the Numbers chapter 6 vow that they took. <laughs> and there's no connection between a Nazarene and a Nazarite, except some of the letters are the same in the word. Okay? Otherwise, there is no connection whatsoever. Okay, a couple more thoughts here and we'll quit. Do you have a PhD? It is amazing how much email I get saying, you don't have a real degree. I say, okay, then don't call me doctor. Call me Kent. Call me Bubba. Call me Hey You. Now, let's get back to the topic. <laughs> they want to try to steer attention away from what I'm talking about on creation. And this is called an ad hominem attack. You know, I don't like the message, so I'm going to attack the messenger. In a graded or judged debate, they would lose points in a hurry by using this tactic. But let me just answer the question. Do you have a PhD? PhD, from Webster's New World Dictionary, means doctor of philosophy. Who has the authority to give PhDs? Well, I suppose technically there is no governing body that makes that decision. So anybody could, in theory. I went uh, to Midwestern Baptist College, Pontiac, Michigan, graduated in 1974. Then I took courses several places and finally took my master's and doctorate from Patriot University, a small Christian university in Colorado. It was a uh, ministry of Hilltop Baptist Church. They started a college and then later added a PhD program. And if you took these courses by correspondence, you could finish your degree. And I did for nine years, you know, worked all day and took courses every, all night, <laughs> most, you know, late. And after nine years, I, I got a PhD from Patriot University. It is a non-accredited Christian school. They had about 400 students. Sometime several years ago, they had a friendly split from the church and the ministry moved into the headquarters of a uh, split-level house in some place in Colorado. And so they do all of their correspondence courses and mailing and secretaries and everything out of this, uh, this house, three-story three house, or three-level, three, uh, split level, three level house. And so somebody put a picture on the Internet of the house saying, this is where Ken Hovind got his Ph.D. First place, I don't know how that matters. Secondly, apparently it's to try to discredit me for some reason. So, okay, pretend I don't have a Ph.D., ignore that. Now, get back to the issue of creation and evolution. I tell people, I worked hard for my degree. I don't know if you worked hard for yours or not. They'll say, well, it's not accredited. So, Harvard's not accredited, Princeton's not accredited, Yale's not accredited. What does accredited mean? It means somebody accepts you. Okay, if you don't accept me, fine. Now forget it. Is your school accredited? No. No, PCC's not accredited. A lot of schools are not accredited. So, <laughs> what's their point? Okay, it's so funny that they would try to... Uh, uh, to do that, you know. There's their phone number, Hilltop Baptist, if you don't believe me, and there's the phone number for Patriot University. Call them up, ask them any questions you want. I think they have a real good program, and I enjoyed my time there. I was able to finish at home, 
you know, it took a long time. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm a little slow, but I did it. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Well, let's see. The skeptics will say, like I debated Terry Pruitt several times at UWF. I'll tell you what. Uh, let's take a quick break. I have to be quick because we do have a lot to cover, and we'll try to finish up the whole thing after the break. This one. All right, well, let's try to finish up here. We have several more questions that get frequently asked, and I'm sure there'll be more to go. Uh, we'll cover some of this on our video number seven. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Very interesting question, actually. I've done many debates with uh, Terry Pruitt, who's a Genesis scholar, who is an atheist, or claims to be, who teaches at University of West Florida. Yeah, I did, let's see, debate, I don't know which numbers, three and four, I think, are with him on our videotape series. A very nice man. He says, oh, there are four different authors for Genesis. There's the uh, JEPD theory that four different people wrote Genesis because the J for Jehovah, which is the Yahwist, uh, Eloist, Priestly, and Deuterist. He's wrong, okay? There are ten different authors for Genesis, not four. Henry Morris has a great note here on Genesis chapter 2, verse number 4. These are the generations of. And you read the uh, Defender's Bible by Henry Morris or read in his book about Genesis... Um, about, uh, you know, this. We'll try to go through this quickly. In Genesis chapter 38, we are told, Judah said to Onan, Go into thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And he decided not to, you know, and God killed him. Then you read in Luke where it says, Master, saying, Master, Moses wrote, If a man's brother had die having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. And people say, See, this proves Moses wrote Genesis. Uh, no, it does not, okay? Because also it tells us in Deuteronomy, if a brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, husband's brother shall go raise up seed to his brother. So Moses wrote Deuteronomy. There's no question in most people's minds that Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses did not write Genesis. He is the editor of Genesis. He put it together from 10 eyewitness accounts. Adam wrote part of the book of Genesis. Noah wrote part. I'll show you. The phrase, these are the generations of, is the break point. That's somebody signing off. They're finishing their part. Some people only wrote one chapter. Apparently, I would assume on clay tablets, you know, bake it in the sun and it's hard. And then Noah takes a few of them on the ark with him. He's got the first few chapters. They're already done. And then Noah or his sons later add to it. And this is a collection. There are very obvious differences in style of writing. In chapter 1, all through chapter 1, it says, God did this, God did that, God did that. 31 times in 31 verses, God is mentioned. When you get to chapter 2, starting with verse 4, which is probably where the chapter break should have been, it says, Lord God. In every case, it's called Lord God. But well, this is Adam writing about the Lord God. Chapter 1, apparently God wrote or told Adam what to write. And this is God talking about himself. But when Adam talked about God, it's Lord God. Not only differences in who God is called, or what God is called, but uh, differences in styles of writing. I agree. So the skeptics and scoffers got it partly right. There is, there is more than one author, author, but there are ten of them, and they're all eyewitnesses. <clears throat> Makes it even better. So people say, well, there are books like, uh, you know, the Babylonians and the you know, ancient cultures have books that are older than Genesis. Well, they might have been written before Moses wrote Genesis, but they're not technically older than Genesis. Because Moses simply collected ten previous accounts. That's like if I today was to rewrite Shakespeare. Somebody could say, well, Abe Lincoln lived before Shakespeare was written. Well, before my copy of it, maybe. <laughs> before Moses' copy of Genesis, yeah, some of the Sumerian account was probably written, you know. Okay. And Mark, it says, have you not read in the book of Moses? How in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is obviously referring back to Exodus. So there's no question the, in Mark it tells us that Moses wrote Exodus. But nowhere does it tell us Moses actually wrote Genesis. Moses just simply edited it. Here's the phrase. These are the generations of. Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. This is Adam signing off. These are the generations of Noah. Genesis 6, 9. This is Noah signing off. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. Okay. They apparently wrote chapter 7, 8, 9. 
Chapter 11, verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Okay? After the three brothers got together and wrote some, Shem wrote some more. Terah, Abram's father, wrote some of the book of Genesis, apparently, up to chapter 11, verse 27. Up to 25, 12 was written by uh, Ishmael. These are the generations of Isaac, chapter 25, verse 19. Esau apparently wrote some. Anyway, there are, these, these are the generations of Jacob in chapter 37. So I would say Henry Morris has got a very profound thought here that you ought to read and consider, that Moses actually was only the editor. There were actually ten different authors. Okay, what are symbiosis relationships? A symbiosis relationship is where the root word uh, where we get our word symphony and lots of different words from that, things that work together, they harmonize. There are literally millions, if not billions, of examples of plants that require certain animals to live and animals that require certain plants to live. You know, there are some flowers that can only be pollinized by one species of fly or moth or wasp. And if none of those flies or moths or wasps or butterflies are around, that plant will die after one generation. And that plant or moth or wa that wasp or moth or, or bug or whatever lays its eggs on that plant and that plant only for the babies to catch and survive and grow. And if those plants aren't available, that bug will die. These are called symbiosis relationships. The clownfish lives in the sea anemones, which have stinging tentacles. Well, the clownfish is brightly colored, and he attracts things in, and the sea anemone eats them. Why doesn't he eat the clownfish? There's a relationship here. Here are two organisms, the anemone and the clownfish, that work together in what is called a symbiosis relationship. As far as I can figure out, they absolutely defy an evolutionary explanation. I don't see any way you can... How did one evolve without the other? They had to be created simultaneously. And there are thousands of those. We could talk forever on that. Okay. Why don't we have giant insects today? <clears throat> Insects breathe through their skin. They don't have lungs. They don't have a diaphragm muscle that's sucking air in and out like we are. You take a breath, you force it out. Insects don't have that. They have a bunch of little holes through their skin going into throughout their body, and that oxygen just simply flows through. And that's how they get it. Well, this works great for the insects up to a certain size. And here's where the problem comes in. If we had a cube that was one inch by one inch by one inch. The way you find the volume is length times width times height, so it has a volume of one. One times one times one is one. The surface area, how many, there are six squares on a cube, like a dice has six sides. Each side is one square inch, so the surface area is six. Which means if we compare the surface area to the volume, we have a six to one ratio. Anybody lost? Okay. What if we double it to two? Two times two times two is how much? Eight. Each side is two inch by two inch, so there are four square inches on a side. We still have six sides. Twenty-four square inches of surface area. We have now dropped it to a three to one. Suppose this was a bug trying to breathe through his skin. He, even though the bug is twice as big, he now only have effectively half as much skin. He starts to have a problem. Let's raise it to three. 27 is the volume. 54 is the surface area. Two to one. At some point, he doesn't have enough skin. He can't get enough oxygen to supply all that tissue inside. Let's drop it to point one. Has a volume of point zero zero one. A surface area of 0 0.06. Now he has a 60 to 1 surface area to volume. Drop it to 0 0.01. 600 to 1. The smaller an insect gets, it eventually becomes basically all skin and no volume, or close to it, okay? Which is why an ant can fall off an airplane, hit the ground and walk off. He has so much surface area, he creates a lot of friction with the air, he just simply can't fall very fast. Just like you could not fall very fast through peanut butter. That's about the way it feels to an ant falling through the air. Whereas you or I falling off an airplane would experience a different landing than the ant would. Okay? So, 
Because of this surface area to volume ratio problem, the bigger an insect gets, the more problem it has getting oxygen, which limits the size depending on how much oxygen is in the, in the atmosphere and how much pressure it's under. We find giant insects fossilized, indicating the Earth must have had a different set of situations. It must have been different at some time in the past. We cover on video number two about the Earth having more oxygen and more air pressure in the pre-flood world. Giant insects are found, like a 50-inch dragonfly and 18-inch cockroaches are found, fossilized. Praise God, not alive today as far as we know. Eight and a half foot centipede found in Germany back in 99. Two foot grasshoppers have been found. So something was different. My conclusion is probably this is tied into the pre-flood environment having more air pressure. I see no other way to explain the existence of giant insects. Now, Walt Brown, who wrote the book In the Beginning, which, uh, in the, which we sell and highly recommend, it's an excellent book, he does not believe there was a canopy. I sat at the airport with Walt Brown for three hours while we had lunch together and talked. I was in Phoenix Airport, and I called him up and said, Brother, i got a layover. Would you please come meet me at the airport? Because I, I love what you do, and I want to meet you. He's a very smart guy. A PhD in physics, uh, retired colonel, lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, brilliant guy. He said, I don't believe there was a canopy. And he's got a whole chapter in the book, which I sell, explaining why there could not have been a canopy. <laughs> uh, I think he's wrong. Because I said, Walt, how do you explain the giant insects? He said, I have a problem with that one. Okay, well, I have a solution. There was a canopy. He said, no, then there's problems with the canopy. You know, what about, and he going on and named the problems, and I said, well, I think there may be a solution to those too. But uh, anyway, that's, that's where it was left. We parted disagreeing, and I'm still selling his book, and thank you, Walt, you did a great job, but take the part about the canopy out. I think you're wrong about that. Okay. Um, is the sun shrinking? Here are the measurements taken from the Royal Observatory and Greenwich uh, Observatory in England over the last 150 years, showing that the sun is shrinking both in uh, vertical diameter and horizontal diameter. The sun is egg-shaped a little bit because it's a big spinning ball. It's bigger at the equator. I would say, yes, it appears that the sun has been shrinking, at least since we've observed it. Now, it swells and contracts and swells and contracts. I understand all that. But the general trend is towards shrinking. I used to say in my seminar that this is one of the proofs that the universe is young. I think it is still a valid proof. Uh, there are a few questions about this, though, because... Um, all we have is a short few hundred years' worth of data. We don't know that this is, we cannot prove this is long-term, you know, for thousands of years. It, has, it hasn't been observed. Um, it, I see no reason why it shouldn't be long-term, because uh, where is the extra mass going to come from? You know, the sun would have to be eating up everything else in the universe in order to keep growing in size. You know, it's, where is it going to come from? The... Uh, basic problem is the sun may be burning by gravitational collapse or it may be burning by nuclear fusion. If it's burning by nuclear fusion, it could burn for billions of years. A little bit of matter, you know, golf ball sized piece of uranium will power a submarine for, you know, years. So the, if the sun is burning by nuclear fusion, it should produce neutrinos. They've done testing, they can't find the neutrinos, so there's a serious missing neutrino problem. Today, nobody still knows, as far as I can figure out, exactly how the sun is burning. So I save this for last in the Q&A section. I do not know uh, for sure how the sun burns. I don't think anybody does. It's one of the two, as far as we know, nuclear fusion or gravitational collapse. If it's fusion, it should produce neutrinos. It doesn't, which leaves the other option. It's probably gravitational collapse, which puts a time limit. It can't be billions of years old. So that's a subject well worthy of study. I don't have an answer. All I have is a few questions on that. What about the Red Sea crossing? Why don't they find evidence of an entire Egyptian army drowning? Well, they might have. In Exodus chapter 14, God told Moses to go to whatever that place is and encamp by the sea. And 14.22 tells us, Children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them. Some people teach, well, it was just a real shallow sea, and they walked across. Ankle-deep water. Oh, well, that's an even bigger miracle. Pharaoh's entire army drowns in ankle-deep water. <laughs> Hello, how's that going to happen? <laughs> Some people have argued, well, there was, you know, an um, asteroid struck the opposite side of the Earth, and it made two tidal waves. They went around the Earth, boom, hit right there, 
separated just long enough for Moses to go across and then phew, came back together and drowned everybody. Ah, two tidal waves hit each other. Mm. Well, okay. <laughs> that you can, you can believe anything you want, okay? But uh, I doubt that one very strongly. The Bible says in Exodus 14, God took off their chariot wheels. That ought to be a clue if you found something, okay? And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Everybody drowns. The Bible's pretty clear about that. If you look at the map of Egypt down here, um, Egypt is right on the Red Sea, of course, which has two fingers coming off the very top. On the left, it's called the Gulf of Suez, where the Suez Canal is. On the right, it's called the Gulf of Aqaba. All of it is the Red Sea. The Bible says they crossed the Red Sea. So some people think, well, they must have crossed the Gulf of Suez, and they wandered around in Sinai Peninsula, and therefore Mount Sinai must be in the Sinai Peninsula. That's why it's called the Sinai Peninsula. <laughs> well, there's a problem with this. Some Phoenician princess was, if I have the story right, you know, uh, five, six, seven hundred years ago sometime, there was, she was riding a wagon through there, and she saw this mountain and said, wow, that's Mount Sinai. How do you know? Oh, I just think it is. Okay. Everybody's called it Mount Sinai ever since because of this one lady <laughs> smoking pot, or apparently who said, I think that's it. That cannot possibly be Mount Sinai. But you look at any Bible map, it'll have that labeled as Mount Sinai with a question mark. Because nobody knows for sure where it is. Well, all you got to do is read the Bible. I'll show you. Here's Ron Wyatt's map. He says they followed the red line all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and crossed the Gulf of Aqaba. One thing to consider is why would it take Pharaoh three days to catch him? I know armies move faster than you know civilians, but three days to catch them. You know they're both still moving. You know uh, that uh, place by the Gulf of Aqaba is actually right here where this valley comes out. There's a, a, a natural waterway. It's a dry riverbed. Okay, I'm sure when it pours rain, you might get some water in there, but it's dry almost all the time. You can see it kind of winding through the rocks right here. That is called a wadi. W a d i. If you went into that wadi, you would find there are rocks all over the place, but they've all been pushed out of the way to make a path. Somebody pushed all the rocks out of the way to make a path for wagons, apparently. That dry riverbed, the wadi, ends up at that white dot, which you can barely see on from this satellite map. This is a strange view. This is kind of looking from the north. You don't normally see maps oriented this way, okay? So on the top, you would see the Gulf of Suez. On the bottom is the Gulf of Aqaba. That white dot is actually this giant beach. Off to the right, you can see where that wadi comes into it, that dry riverbed. And at the bottom of that beach, way down there, which would be the south end, because this, again, is looking from the north, a strange orientation for a map, but that's the way it is. At the south end of the beach, which is gigantic, by the way, so those squares on there are factories, you know, huge storage facilities. So this is gigantic beach area. At the south end, Ron Wyatt found this pillar. It had fallen down, half in the water. He and his sons dragged it out, scrubbed it off. A lot of it was eroded, but part of it was still readable. And it basically said something to the effect of, this pillar was erected by King Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. So they thought, is this where they crossed the Red Sea? Hmm. So they applied for passports to get into Saudi Arabia. Let's go check the other side. Arabian government says, no, no American spies allowed in here. You know, whatever, okay. So they went in illegally, got arrested, spent a lot of time in jail, long story there, okay? Ron Wyatt did. Ron Wyatt, yep, he and his sons. But they went on the other side of this Gulf of Aqaba, it's about eight or nine miles across right there, and found another pillar, just like the one on the other side. So they went and did some research. Uh, the National Geophysical Data Center in Boulder, Colorado has a map showing the depth of the water. How deep is the water? Above this red arrow, you can see where it says the Elan Deep, or Elat Deep. It's nearly 5,000 feet deep. The Gulf of Aqaba is. Incredibly deep water. South of there is the Aragonese Deep, which again is nearly 5,000 feet deep. But right where that arrow is, there's a shallow place. It's only 900 feet deep, which is still pretty deep. But 900 foot in eight or nine miles is a nice gentle slope down and a nice gentle slope up. Easy for wagons. There's an underwater land bridge right there. He says they walked across 
on dry ground, 900 foot wall of water on both sides. I've always wondered, did any fish fall out when they're walking across? That's one of those strange questions that I have. I'm going to ask the Lord when I get to heaven. Uh, Aaron uh, went there. I forget Aaron's last name. I've corresponded with him many times. Aaron starts with an S, I believe. Anyway, he said, The underwater pathway at the Red Sea crossing site discovered by the late Ron Wyatt has received an incredible amount of criticism. We have taken two recent trips to the Red Sea with the latest sounding equipment to carry out depth soundings on the seabed. The data has proved the presence of an underwater pathway without doubt, and the reports and pictures from the first trip can be accessed at anchorstone.com slash Wyatt slash Red Sea underline update 02 HTML. Our data does match the Israeli bathymetric chart, and I, for one, would appreciate a public refutal by anyone who has publicly stated that it does not exist, as this is not true. And I believe it would be honorable to do so if one has published a lie unknowingly and then learns the truth, because many people have criticized Ron Wyatt for everything, okay? And I get flacked for even mentioning Ron Wyatt. <laughs> there are ministries who won't recommend me just because I recommend Ron Wyatt. I say just read what he wrote. I have nearly all of Ron Wyatt's pictures that he has published on posters that I got from him. All kinds of stuff. There's a whole stack of them right here, posters from Ron Wyatt. He was a good friend of mine. I disagree with him strongly on some issues. He knows better now. He's in heaven. Now he's a Baptist. Um, but Ron and his sons went scuba diving in the Red Sea. Out, You know, you can only scuba dive so deep. They didn't go down 900 feet. Here's what some idiots will say. Well, that place is 900 feet deep, and you can't scuba dive 900 feet deep. That proves he's lying. Uh, duh. <laughs> okay, it's not 900 feet deep at the edge. Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How some people can be so dumb and still live, I don't know. But they apparently do. Anyway, uh, he went out to as deep as they could go, 100 feet or whatever, 150 feet with the scuba equipment, and found all along, as far as they could go, chariot wheels with no chariots attached to them, and chariot bodies crumbling badly, poorly conditioned, you know, with no wheels on them. They found horse skeletons and human skeletons crusted over with coral. The chariot wheels, you can see one here in this picture. It's kind of hard to see, but underwater photography has enough problems, you know. Uh, it's gold-plated wood, but the wood has rotted out. So when you try to pick it up, it just crumbles. Okay, it's a real thin gold veneer, like picking up chrome bumper after the bumper's gone, just the chrome is left. That's basically what you get. But the um, 18th dynasty of Egypt did have four-spoke chariot wheels. I think Ron's got a whole story about this on his website, uh, which is wyattmuseum.com, explaining the whole thing. There's only one Egyptian dynasty that used four-spoke, six-spoke, and eight-spoke, all three types used in this one dynasty. And all three are found down there, or something like that. Okay, he does pretty well, good research on that. If you look at the far right, <clears throat> this arrow is pointing to a mountain in Saudi Arabia called Jabal al-Laws, which means Mountain of Laws. It's been labeled that for centuries. Could Mount Sinai be in Arabia? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 4. Which gendereth the bondage which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Hello, it's been there all along, folks, okay? Why have they been looking in the Sinai Peninsula? That's not where it is. This is a picture of the mountain that apparently is Mount Sinai. The top of it is still black. This may be the place where Moses got the Ten Commandments. At the bottom, you can see an altar with a calf on it. This may be the altar that uh, Moses or Aaron set up. Okay. God told Moses to uh, stand upon the rock. He said, Thou shalt smite the rock, and water will come out that the people may drink. Of course, most Bible pictures will show a little stream of water coming out. How long would it take to water two million people plus their cows and sheep? <laughs> It'll take a little while, wouldn't it? This Bible, map, or Bible picture shows a little bigger stream. Well, that's getting closer. Actually, this building is from a taken, picture taken from a half mile away. This rock is as tall as a five-story building. It is split right down the middle. Ron says, this is the place, this is the rock that split in half. And water came pouring out. You can see erosion marks. It would be worth getting his video if you want to really study more on this, uh, called the Evidences Video or Discoveries, I think it is. Ron Wyatt Discoveries. Really good. He also found some strange things like Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says brimstone came down. There is a picture of ash, solid ash cliffs. Apparently, the city was burned so badly by these raining sulfur. Ron gave me, and I have right here behind the curtain, some of the sulfur balls. 
I don't let many folks handle these because every time you handle it, some rubs off, okay? And then uh, eventually they'll be gone. I've had several friends, even some scoffers, who said, I don't think that's true. And they went over there to the place where Ron said they were, and they dug through the ash, and sure enough, there are literally millions of these sulfur balls. The outside is kind of a white. I know sulfur is yellow. I taught science, okay? Um, if you scrape off this white coating, it's pure yellow sulfur, 99.6% pure sulfur. You can smell it for sure. Um, apparently, it, burning sulfur dripped on that city, or rained on the city. As the sulfur would burn itself out, it would encapsulate itself in its own ash and shut off its oxygen supply. Ends up with a coating around a pure sulfur ball. No, found no place in the world except this, this place over there. I don't know if that's Sodom and Gomorrah or not, but it sure looks like it to me. I think it's worth considering that this may be the spot. You're welcome to come see this after a class if you'd like. So that indeed may be Sodom and Gomorrah, and Ron's got a lot of stuff on that. There's uh, Richard Reeves, who's a friend of mine, took over for Ron. Lives up just south of Nashville. He's poking through the wall. This is apparently a brick wall that was burned, and sulfur burns extremely hot, and it baked the brick into ash. And you can poke through the wall and find these things by the millions, these sulfur balls. They're still there today. If you don't believe me, go take a look. Okay. By the way, I'm going over to Israel next spring. I'll have to try to get down there and bring back some more sulfur balls. They're pretty fragile. Transporting them might be a problem, but we'll figure out a way. What is a unicorn? Okay, I will quickly say I do not know. I wish I did. The Bible mentions unicorn in Numbers 23. It says he has the strength of a unicorn. Uh, God brought him out of Egypt. He were, has, hath as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Job 39, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? This apparently is referring to plowing, like you wouldn't use an ox or a, a horse. You, like you, would, you can't use a unicorn for that. Will you trust him because his strength is great, or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into the barn? These verses tell us that apparently the unicorn is something similar to an animal you would plow with, but you wouldn't use him for that because he's, he's wild. Even though he's strong, he's untamable. That's what I get out of that. Psalm 29 says he will skip like a young unicorn. Exalt the horn of an unicorn. I think this verse tells us it had one horn in Psalm 92. From these verses, and that's really all the Bible says about the unicorn that I can find, I think it was an animal with one horn. I doubt that it was a horse with a horn, though it might have been, but we've seen so many pictures of that, it's going to be hard to get that out of our mind. Probably some kind of single horn dinosaur, Monoclonius, Styracosaurus. Several dinosaurs had one horn. Nobody trains reptiles to do much of anything. You wouldn't, even though alligators are strong, you wouldn't hook them up to your harness to plow your field. <laughs> They're untamable. Uh, Okay, don't wisdom teeth prove evolution? No, they don't. I have, skeptics, several of them have said, oh, wisdom teeth prove evolution. See, we're evolving. We're getting smaller jaws. Hello? Getting smaller is not evolving. That's the opposite. <laughs> You're going backwards here. Think about it. Suppose people were 10 feet tall before the flood. Suppose they were 25 before they reached maturity. Suppose you were a kid for... 25 years. Okay? Wisdom teeth come in right now at about age somewhere between 16 and 25. Okay? Well, that would be about right. If you're 10 feet tall, your head's bigger, your jaw's bigger. By that time, you're, as your jaw grows, it's about time for that extra tooth to come in. Otherwise, when you chew on something, you bite on the gum. Try to chew something past where your teeth stop. Chew on your gum a few times and see how that feels. Okay? Bite into something hard, especially, and see how it feels. <laughs> okay? It's not a good feeling. So, wisdom teeth, I think, are evidence that man matured slower in the past and grew bigger. And today, we are genetically inferior and we're smaller and maturing faster. And therefore, wisdom teeth are indeed a problem for many people. But that is not proof for evolution. No, it is not. There's a great book by Jack Coazzo called Buried Alive, which we offer in our bookstore, who deals with this subject. He's a dentist. He studied all the Neanderthals, and many of them have wisdom teeth fully erupted. No problem with it at all. Okay, what about the Sabbath? 
Are Christians supposed to honor the Sabbath? Exodus 20, God said, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, and the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it thou shalt not do any work. And I have a letter at least once a week, sometimes once a day, from a Seventh-day Adventist saying, Rehoboam, I love your seminar. However, you don't tell people to honor the Sabbath. That is correct. I do not, because I think you don't have to. Hey, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I have, I've, I've spoken at a couple Seventh-day Adventist churches. Okay, There's a lot of good folks. I'm not against them. I think they're wrong on the Sabbath issue, though. God said in Exodus 20, Remember the Sabbath. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Don't work, and don't let any strangers work. Well, this would mean you couldn't go out to eat because you're making somebody else cook your food. Is that right? Let's see what else the Sabbath. Exodus 20, 11, Ten Commandments. God rested on the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 31, verse 14. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Should anybody that doesn't do the Sabbath be put to death? Okay. Whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall be surely put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Who shall keep the Sabbath? Children of Israel. I'm not one of them. I'm Norwegian. Vord is ordered to dog, okay? To observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. The Sabbath is very obviously a covenant between God and the children of Israel. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Okay. Sabbath was for the children of Israel. Exodus 20. Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths. Who's he speaking to? Elders of Israel, not Exodus, this is Ezekiel 20. It should be a sign between me and you. And the Sabbaths were not the Saturdays. They were days of rest. Sometimes came on a Wednesday. Sabbaths were the children of Israel. Nehemiah chapter 9. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Nehemiah is saying, God, I'm so glad you came down on Mount Sinai and made known your Sabbath. Which means they didn't know when the Sabbath was for 2,500 years. Right? Nobody knew when it was. God made known to Moses when the Sabbath was. <clears throat> By the hand of Moses, thy servant. This is 2,500 years after the creation. Okay, here's what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath. Children of Israel, you shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. If you really want to keep the Sabbath, shut off your furnace, shut off your hot water, shut off your stove, don't cook any food. And if you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what you do. But I'm just saying that's what, this, what, this would be required of you. Prohibit cooking, hot water, furnace, internal combustion engines. Don't start your car. You are kindling a fire. Exodus 16, 29. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the Sabbath day. How on earth could you have a Seventh-day Adventist church? People can't come. Right? There are Seventh-day Baptists. Church on Saturday. I, I'm not, I wouldn't fight them. I'm just saying, if you study the scripture, you'll find people say, why, aren't, why don't you, you know, honor the Sabbath? Well, I guess a lot of reasons. God rested on the seventh day because he's done. He told the Jews to rest on the seventh day as a sign. Okay, I'm not Jewish and I'm not done. So, <laughs> I have to work. <laughs> That's why. So you don't go out of your house. Uh, Acts 1.12. Okay. We have a book uh, by Peter Ruckman who is rude, crude, crass, and everything else, but it really is fun reading if you, want, if you can handle the sarcasm. I, I didn't write it. We do offer it because I get asked the questions often. It's two bucks, I think, at yeah, $1.95. If you want our office, uh, call our office, you can get this, Why I'm Not a Seventh-day Adventist. I think his method of handling them is a little unnecessarily harsh, but 
I took Peter Ruckman out to eat lunch a couple of months ago. First time I've ever met the guy, you know. I took him out to eat. He's 80-some years old. One of the smartest and grouchiest men I've ever met in my life. <laughs> but he really, I'm glad he's on our side. He's a really smart man, and he's doing a, done a great work. Wouldn't fight him at all. Couldn't join him. Wouldn't fight him. One of those kind of things. And I wouldn't fight the Seventh-day Adventists. They're good folks. But I think if you really study the scriptures, you'll find they're wrong. Okay? So, that's it. We have lots of questions come in. If you get more questions on creation, evolution, I get a whole variety of topics, obviously, you know, uh, other than that. But uh, that's uh, what we cover in our seminar. Appreciate you all coming to class. And uh, if you have any questions, if you're watching the videotape, feel free to call. I can assure you I get nearly 1,000 email a week now. I will not give you a long personal response to your email if I give you a response at all. It's not because I'm mad at you or I don't like what you said or I'm afraid to talk to you. I get skeptics say, you didn't answer my email for three weeks. Oh, that proves you're afraid of me. <laughs> I'm not the least bit afraid of you. Uh, I don't have time, okay? <laughs> I haven't even read my email for four days now. But uh, you send it. If you call, please, I'll be glad to uh, talk to you by phone. That's about the best I can do. Jessica, you answer the phone. You know how it gets around here. Uh, sorry, that's, that's the best I can do. But I do make myself available with cell phone and... Uh, regular phone, and I'm on it all day long, so you call one of those, I'll be glad to talk with you. Thank you so much. Dismissed.